Hi, I'm Penny Lane. I'm the director of the new HBO documentary, Listening to Kenny G. He's just sort of part of the musical furniture of American culture. It's just wallpaper. With Kenny G's music, what can you say? How are you feeling? Underappreciated, in general. I don't think there's anything wrong with hard work. That's a hard lick, and I just played it really well. Putting in the reps, and then reaping the reward of, hey, I'm really good at this. I think that's why my career's lasted this long. The fact of the matter is, Kenny G in the 1990s was one of the most well-known musicians on this planet. Somebody asked me, well, what kind of music do you do? Is it jazz? I don't know. You might think it might be jazz. Well, is it pop? I don't know. You might think it might be pop. He was having a huge impact on defining what jazz is, even though the jazz community were looking at his music with disdain. These are songs from my heart. This is the way I just hear it. They think I've decided to play these kind of songs because I knew they would sell well. If only I was that smart. People have gotten married to his music, had babies by his music. He makes playing an instrument really cool. I've been listening to him since I was a baby. At the same time, he is also one of the most hated people in jazz. What the hell's not to like? There's something deeply powerful about the fact that that music has reached millions of people. The fact that what appeals to me also appeals to other people. That's the beautiful thing. And that is a trailer from the HBO documentary Listening to Kenny G. And this is Factual America. We're brought to you by Alamo Pictures, an Austin and London based production company making documentaries about America for international audiences. I'm your host, Matthew Sherwood. Each week, I watch a hit documentary and then talk with the filmmakers and their subjects. This week, it is my pleasure to welcome the award-winning filmmaker, Penny Lane, the director of the HBO documentary, Listening to Kenny G. Kenny G, the best-selling instrumentalist of all time, is loved and loathed alike, which in many ways reveals more about us and our artistic tastes than it does the man himself. Don't believe me? Well, stay tuned, and let's listen to Penny Lane. Penny, welcome to Factual America. How are things with you? Pretty good, thanks. Yes, it's great to have you. The, uh, the film is Listening to Kenny G, available to watch on HBO and stream on HBO Max starting December 2nd. Um, Penny, uh, again, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we usually start with the uh, fairly basic question, uh, but maybe for our audience, just why don't you tell us, if you don't mind, give us a synopsis of what is Listening to Kenny G all about? So Listening to Kenny G is a documentary about um, why Kenny G is the best-selling instrumental artist of all time and why his success rubs some people the wrong way, like why certain people really hate Kenny G, basically. Yeah, I mean, he's uh, loved and loathed alike. Um... Mostly always- loved. It's always important to say, you know, because like, <laughs> I mean, really, because most yes. of the time when I tell people like what the film is about, they're yeah. like, who, who hates Kenny G? Like, what? Really? You know, so yeah. So, you know, most people yeah. on this planet love, love Kenny G and cannot fathom uh, not loving Kenny G. But, you know, there's a kind of world that I live in that, you know, maybe we could summarize as like cultural elites or something mm-hmm. where, you know, the presumption is that, of course, you understand that Kenny G's music is terrible and, you know, you would never be a fan. Yeah. Um, but yeah. but that's not normal. <laughs> like, that's not most people's attitude toward him. OK, so that's interesting, because I was going to say this may end up being one of our most, you know, we've we've discussed death penalty. We've discussed all kinds of controversial stuff subjects on this podcast but that this may end up being our most controversial podcast but what Might you're be. telling me yeah it may be uh, depending on who our audience and what our demographics that's are, right I guess. but exactly uh in other ways this could be the least controversial is what you're saying yep could be the most popular <laughs> <laughs> well we're hoping for that um so uh i mean and and thank you again for making this because this is i mean i was going to say this is not your typical biopic if, if it is even that at all um, and so, you, as you've already just done, you you cut straight to the point um, about this. Uh, um, you know, here's this best-selling instrumentalist of all time, uh, but yet, what is it? There's this visceral hatred out there, or has been at least, 
um, and loathed by certain, as you said, elites, cultural, jazz establishment, maybe. Um, I mean, did you, what were your thoughts going in? What were your allegiances before you started making this project? Well, I wouldn't have been able to do it if, like, I was in the camp of people whose, like, yeah. blood pressure goes yeah. up when they hear the beginning of Songbird, you know? And that's yeah. a lot of my friends, you know, do have, like, a, a visceral negative yeah. reaction. And that's one of the things I show in the film is I actually, you know, kind of force these music critics to listen right. to his music. And we kind of watch their faces. And it's just kind of like they're grimacing. And, you know, Ben Ratliff looks like he's trying to, yeah. like, hold it far away from him. Like, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, so so I'm not in that camp. Like, I'm not a fan. I don't, I don't like, love this music. It was, you know, certainly yeah. I grew up in the 90s, like, being into, like, what we then called alternative music. So it wasn't right. like, you know, certainly at that time I would have said, like, oh, yeah, hate that you know, music. <laughs> But I don't get mad about it. Like it's yeah. not, it doesn't upset me. It doesn't offend me. So yeah. for me, like I had a little bit of fun with like looking at that anger and kind of laughing at it. Cause it is kind of funny. Like, yeah. like why should it be the case that like this incredibly inoffensive music would cause so much anger? Like it's actually funny. Um, so that was kind of, that was my attitude going into it. It's like, this is kind of funny, but it also gets at something deep. Like, Trying to answer that question, I think, will tell me something about the nature of music and personal taste and identity and, like, how we think about those conflicts and, like, what is good art and who gets to decide. So that, for me, was the value of trying to answer the question of why yeah. certain people get so angry about him. Well, I mean, since we're on this topic, and I was someone going to ask you later, actually coming back from the break, but uh, why do you think, uh, I shouldn't say so many, why do you think there's this core group of people who can't stand his music or have this reaction to him? I think it's generally people who have like a deep love for jazz. You know, they have like a real investment in, a, in, in, in like whatever version of jazz that they have an investment in. And they see this guy who's doing nothing, doing none of the things that they think are important, like really just kind of hollowing out anything that would be good or valuable about jazz and, and replacing it with something they think of as being quite soulless and dumb. Uh, and then they see, and then the worst part is, now all that would be fine if he were not the most successful living <laughs> jazz artist, you know, by like a landslide. Like all that would be like offensive to them on some level, but the anger I really do think comes from his success. And I, and again, I get it. Like, I feel this way about things that I feel this way about. It just mm -hmm. isn't jazz and Kenny G. Like, we all have yeah. our, like, little camps that we're in. Yeah. And there's something very upsetting about when your opinions about art are kind of proven wrong by the marketplace in some kind of way. Like, it, it bothers people. It bothers one when that happens. Or, or, or is it they don't even think they've been proven wrong? It's just that the rest of society doesn't get it. Is that oh, an yeah. element well, that, of that? This yeah. is so, it's, it's so it's depressing because that means everyone's dumb. You know, yeah. why is everyone so dumb? Why don't they have good taste like me? You know, and, you yeah. know, I, I thought it was really important to try to, like, deal with the music as music. Like, I was trying to kind of create a kind of music criticism piece. Like, that was kind of my approach. As, as you said, it's not really a biopic. Like, there's biographical elements, but they're only there if I think they can help illuminate the music. Like, what is this music? What is going into it? How are people hearing it? Like, what is the context in which you hear it? How does that affect your associations with it? Like, you know, if you if you heard it first at your parents' wedding, you're going to associate different things to it than, than if you heard it first in an elevator, you know? So th all these things are, like, really important. So, um, yeah, so I just tried to, like, bring as many different points of view to the music as I could. Like, what are all the different ways we could consider this music? And and so why why tell this story now? What is it that uh, uh, said, we need a Kenny G doc? Well, I thought, like, you know, it was a good time to do a film about him specifically because he was having this, he is having this kind of renaissance moment um, you know, and it's not to overstate it. I mean, he's been around this whole time. I'm not trying to say like he disappeared for 20 years. Not at all. He's got a very successful career. He's still touring the world. He's not playing the biggest venues in the world, but he's still touring and playing big venues. 
Anyway, but, you know, when I was thinking about this film, he'd already kind of shown up on Kim Kardashian's Twitter timeline. You know, he had this association with Kanye West. He played on Kanye's new album. So I was like, what? Like, and watching the internet react to that was really what gave me the feeling of, like, now is an interesting moment. Because you've got this younger generation that doesn't have these negative associations with him at all. Like, they're like... Like, you know, they're 20. Like, they weren't around when this music was being forced upon you, you know, pumped into your eardrums at every turn. You know, so they hear it and they hear this kind of like retro 80s sound that, you know, I think sounds kind of cool, you know. And so I thought that was really interesting. And then seeing how, like, thinking about Kanye, the genius that he is, the crazy genius that he is, and like, was that kind of a troll, you know, like, was there kind of a troll in there? But also the song is really good. And like, Kenny's part in it is really good. And so you're like, it's, there's a lot of like, I thought cognitive dissonance going on in that moment where the internet was like, wait, do I love Kenny G or do I hate Kenny G? I'm not sure. Like, I felt like that was what the internet was asking at that moment. And so in telling this story, I mean, what have we, I mean, what have we gotten wrong, or some of us of a certain age, maybe have gotten wrong all along? I mean, is he misunderstood? You think this, the individual Kenny Gorlick, um, is he, um, I mean, he was never really trying to be some of the things that his critics would criticize yeah. him for being. You yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think that the kind of common misconceptions that I would have, or that I had, so I could sort of assume a lot of people had, uh, you know, first of all, when you encounter this music in the context that I described, where it's like, as Ben Ratliff says in the film, you know, the, the kind of the sound of corporate America trying right. to calm me down. Right. Like, right. you know, right. Right. that that is a very particular way to encounter music. And so... For me, you know, I would probably never have even thought, like, who is Kenny G? Why does he make this music like the person? It just never crossed my mind that there, behind that music was an artist. It, it felt like it had been manufactured for, for like, this corporate purpose, you know? So I think the biggest misconception is that he's a person um, and that he actually is an artist making artistic choices and trying to express himself in as authentic a way as he can. Another misconception about Kenny is that, yeah, if he if he felt like it, he could play, you know, really sophisticated jazz, but he's made the conscious decision to play dumb jazz to make money. I mean, I don't think that's true at all. I, I think neither one of those things is true. I mean, I don't think he knows anything about jazz, so there's no way that he could perform the kind of jazz that people are thinking of. Um, and, and then he's also, you know, of course he's a savvy businessman, like every artist in the marketplace needs to think about an audience and like how to meet them, but I don't think he's any more calculated in terms of how he's putting out his music than any other artist is. Like, are you thinking about what feedback you've gotten in the past from your fans? Yeah, like probably. But he is just largely, you know, doing art stuff, coming up with melodies, you know, working out songs that he likes and putting them out there. And, and at heart, he's he's a he's always been a pop artist, isn't it? I mean, I you, think you, so. Is a way of putting it. I think so. Yeah, and that's another thing that's interesting is that you know the, that whole way of thinking about music now is just so dated, like. It, genre genre really mattered in the world of a record store. Like, it really mattered what section, yes, or radio. It really mattered what station you were on or what section you were in because that determined literally who was going to see it. Like, because I didn't go to the jazz section when I went into Newbury Comics. I went to, like, the indie rock section. Like, you know, so that's not how it is anymore. Like, people don't access music that in that way and so now it kind of there's so much less at stake with the question like is this jazz is this pop is this r&b is this a crossover like it kind of doesn't matter the same way as it used to at least that's my hypothesis it doesn't seem to matter as much and then i guess what maybe um affects his or uh, exercises his critics maybe is uh he does have this keen cultural awareness and business sense and he is extremely successful at, at many of the things he touches um uh and then he has this ability to build this incredible connection with his fans which i found interesting it's it's multicultural it's got a broad demographic that was uh for me that was enlightening that's another misconception like a lot of people if you ask why do you hate you know what's so wrong with Kenny G, they would say, he's making music for rich white people. And I'm like, 
have you been to his shows? Like, I like yeah. rich yeah. white people are the people who hate his music. Like, what are you even <laughs> talking about? Like, that makes no sense. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Like, really, talk to like an, a normal middle class black American and ask them if the people in their friend circle hate Kenny G. I guarantee that 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 typically the answer is no. They're like, what? That's like part of the soundtrack of our lives in, at that point in history. Well, and they're certainly it's well an, represented yeah. in your uh, crowd scenes that you show. In, yeah, yeah, in yeah, concert yeah, footage, yeah. You know, yeah. Um, it's like who's going? Who's taking their wife there on a date? You know. <laughs> yeah, I think that takes us a, a good, to a good point for an early break uh, for our audience. Uh, we'll be right back with Penny Lane, the director of Listening to Penny G on HBO and HBO Max from December 2nd. You're listening to Factual America. Subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter at Alamo Pictures to keep up to date with new releases or upcoming shows. Check out the show notes to learn more about the program, our guests, and the team behind the production. Now back to Factual America. Welcome back to Factual America. I'm here with award-winning director Penny Lane. Her latest doc is Listening to Kenny G. Uh, it's going to be on HBO and streaming on HBO Max from December 2nd, certainly in uh, North America. Uh, Penny, I mean, we kind of alluded to this earlier, but how did this project come about? Well, Bill Simmons was putting together a series of music documentaries for HBO. The series is called Music Box, and um, he asked me if I wanted to pitch any ideas for the series, and I really liked him and wanted to work with him and also wanted to work with HBO. Like, I wanted the job, basically. Yeah, yeah. So even though initially I was like, no, oh, no, I don't, I really, music documentaries are just not my thing, like, at all. Okay. I don't watch them ever. I mean, yeah. I really don't. Like, it doesn't matter yeah. if I like yeah. the band or don't. Like, I just won't watch it. Like, yeah. and, you know, and it's it's just a tough form. I think it's there's a lot of um, problems with the form of the biography in general. But then when you add yeah. having to cover all the bases of the art, it's, like, kind of tough. Anyway, so, but so I thought, well, if I could, I had this idea. So then in that context, I had this idea to do Kenny G and um, and to think about these questions that we've been discussing uh, through Kenny G. And I pitched that to Bill and he loved it. So I figured at that point, like he'd either never call me again or he would love it. And luckily he did. So we started working on it and it was just a dream project, honestly, from the beginning. Like everyone involved was so great. I had the greatest executives. You know, Kenny was just a dream, like... It was my was, first time making a celebrity movie, yeah, and like yeah. I had a lot of fear about what that would yeah. be like. And you know, I had this image of like this kind of, you know, you know, barrage of handlers that would kind of constantly keep me from him or something. Right. And that was not like we just texted each other and like talked, and he was very direct and available to us, and really hot, wanted to be, wanted to give us the best performance he could give us. Wanted to like help us make the best movie we could make. So he was just like awesome like he was so gracious and and generous with his time and his energy he never ran out of energy either by the way we the well, shooting it, days would, would eventually end but only because i was tired not yeah. because he was well I, I think that comes across as pretty amazing for a man in his 60s from what i can from tell um i mean how did you i mean you mentioned he's so gracious uh, but how did you gain access i mean he could have, obviously imagine someone like him he could easily have said no uh but so he certainly yeah, comes and, off and, as a and, willing participant in this. Oh, yeah. And he was. And he's been great in the release as well. Because um, he's smart. And, like, he understands that, like, this yeah. is a way of um, getting attention and being part of the conversation and culture. I mean, yeah. he knows that. And he also probably had a sense that the audience that I was directing this toward was not necessarily the same audience that would, like, already be hearing about his new album or, like... Mm -hmm aware that he's touring. So like he wants to tour, he wants to sell albums, he wants to tour. So I think he saw that it was a good opportunity. And I think honestly, you know, and he said this, so I think it's safe to say, I think he liked me and he trusted me. And that was pretty meaningful. Um, you know, it, it, at the point where I pitched this to him, he did have um, some people in his circle of advisors mm -hmm. telling him to say no, um, because, you know, why wouldn't you want to make some, let's make something ourselves. Let's make right, like, right you know, a thing where you get back end and you have creative control. Right. And he, he at that point, he could have said no, but he was like, look, I've got an offer on the table from HBO. Mm -hmm. Why would I, like, yeah. give that up in favor of some other thing that may or may not happen? And he was right, because there is no audience for 
uh, self-produced Kenny G EPK in yeah. 2021. Like no one's going to watch that. There's yeah. no audience for that. Um, so he made a good choice, uh, but he, it wasn't, it didn't take a lot of convincing. I, I approached him with the idea. He said, yes. Yeah. And then how much time did you spend with him? Cause it's, it seems like it's kind of constant. I mean, I know you were following him around, but it's, uh, it seems pretty concentrated. You've got him at a sort of, it was interesting. I thought the different ways you approached him in terms of backstage, sit down interview, uh, observational, in the this studio. Sort of, in the yeah. studio. Yeah. Yes, that kind of yeah. stuff. Yeah. It was kind of not that many shoot days for a documentary yeah. because he was so good on camera. Like every minute we filmed with him was great and usable. Um, so at a certain point it was like, oh, like we kind of like have enough. Like, so I had, I remember estimating to him that we might film with him for 20 days or 25 right, right. days yeah. and it ended up being like half that. Maybe it was 12. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. And, and you said you found him, you, I mean, I think what we see is what we get, what you see, what you get with, uh, what we see on the screen, a nice personal, I so. um, um, I mean, certainly, certainly very confident. In himself but i guess you would be too if you were the best-selling instrumentalist in the world um yeah and maybe the best golfer music's ever produced and all these other things i mean it's uh um i mean what were your own personal impressions of him i loved being around kenny i mean you know even just in the edit it was like everyone involved just smiling ear to ear like all day every day like he's just yeah. kind of a delightful person you know i mean yeah. so you know again there there his his character is complicated and people don't walk it's, out of the film necessarily all being like he's great and perfect like yeah, there's a yeah, lot yeah, of yeah. layers there yeah, yeah. but in terms of like what it's like just to be around him like he's a yeah. he's a delightful person yeah. everywhere i go with him you know his interactions with people are just really lovely and sincere and he, as you said, what you see is what you get in a very real way with him. Like, I, I never saw, like, some other version of yeah, Kenny. Yeah. Um, you know, and obviously, again, I don't know his soul. Like, I've spent a few weeks with him. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the consistency was there. Like, there was never any other person that would show up when the camera turned off or something. I mean, he strikes me as, in that way, he is a bit guarded. We don't know what his soul is in, in that sense. Um and I guess he's always been a Kenny G, probably is, there's always been this persona that's Kenny G as well. That uh, I think so. Yeah. And yeah. that's fine with me. Like my goal yeah. in the film was not to be like, let me peel back the layers and, exactly. and you know, you yeah. know, that wasn't my in interest. So yeah. I was kind of um, like for me, like, you know, getting an accurate read on his self presentation is fine. Like that feels like enough for me. How he wants you to think about him feels very informative. Like, you know, he really, the thing he cares about the most is he wants everyone to know how hard he works. Yeah. That's like, the, that's the thing that he yes. wants you to know. Yeah. Like, if there's one thing he wants you to know, it's that, like, he works really, really hard and he is putting in those hours to try to be the yeah. best Kenny well, G he can be. If know? there's one thing I'm taking away from this is that he practices three hours a day. I mean, yeah. he mentions that, I don't know how, but, but was this uh -huh. always your, was this always your aim to tell the story this way? I mean, this folk, you know, bringing in the critics and fans alike and how you've, how you told the story is that, or is that something that evolved as you started filming yeah, and working Yeah, I would this? say what evolved was Kenny, right? So like I had yeah. this idea that was very conceptual. It wasn't about like Kenny G, the person. It was like, right. you know, kind of using him as like a screen upon which I could project these ideas and explore these themes. But I wasn't thinking a lot about like, who is Kenny G as an artist? How does he think about music? How did he become a musician? Like all that stuff was not. So what evolved was really the more traditional biographical elements. Like that, those made their way in in a way that I was like, oh, like I wasn't really expecting that. But, you know, he's so fascinating that once you've got him, it'd be insane to not try to learn more about him because he's so interesting like it would be like negligent as a filmmaker to ignore right. this fascinating person and try to get to know him so the film ended up being quite tricky in post to find the balance like you know how much do we want to hear criticism how much do we want to hear praise mm. how much do we want to hear about kenny's story how much do you want to hear about like culture at large so that that was the challenging part was really trying to find those um that balance and trying to negotiate how people are thinking about him from like scene one to scene two to scene three like what are the things about him that annoy people how do i where do i position that you know how do you give a sense of an arc 
to, to this person. Like that, all that kind of stuff was, was more challenging than yeah. all the production was really fun. Yeah. And, and then, I mean, at the risk of not being uh, balanced, uh, we go back to these critics and these academics you brought on. I mean, these, uh, did you find that they slowly begun, begrudgingly started to acknowledge maybe there was something more to, to Kenny G than they would like to admit. So uh, there, I will say I don't name names, but a few are strike me as being a bit uh, caricatures of themselves in many, <laughs> in many cases. Uh, I won't say. I, who, I would but... say that, like, uh, yes. Yeah, so, so two things. One is that I only cast people with nuance, like people who I knew were going to come in and be able to think on different levels. Like I would never have cast somebody to come in and just bash Kenny. So, right. like, the film kind of creates a bit of a an artificial feeling of an arc for yeah. the critics like yeah. as if like they all kind of come in mad and they all kind of leave less mad but that's that's artificial i mean that's filmmaking yeah. um yeah. you know in yeah. reality they came in very much doing like a on the one hand on the other hand thing yeah. and that was yeah. why i picked them because they were all people with senses of humor who were who got it like who got that like talking about kenny g was actually really interesting um and and who were willing to go there and like kind of play with me and like you know play around and like those interviews were really long and they were very informal um and i think the listening aspect really loosens people up and like puts them in more of a casual conversational mode and so we we went really deep those interviews were really fun um yeah. and i wish i could have used even more of them uh, you know yeah. but it's, it's only so much you can cram in there uh but can i i mean i should add and for our listeners if it hasn't come across yet and i, I do mention this in the intro uh uh but uh I laughed out loud several times during this film. I mean, this is a lovely, this is a humorous take as well as serious look at, at a lot of different things, like all great docs, there's many, many facets to them. Um, and I thought this was uh, extremely, uh, I mean, really enjoyed that aspect of it. I mean, it was just kind of, uh, it wasn't what I, I, I was necessarily expecting. What was I expecting? I don't know. But it was not the film I was expecting, and I was so thankful for that. Uh, and right. I guess, and I guess you didn't reach out to Pat Metheny then, if. Uh, oh no, we did actually. Oh, um, did you? We reached out to him. <laughs> yeah, we we thought about it a long time. Like, should we reach out yeah. to Pat Metheny? Like, whatever. And I thought we should because yeah. we made his letter such an important. Like, he wrote this for people that don't know. He wrote this like incendiary, basically Screen. message yeah. board, yeah. like a message board post. You know, yeah. in the year two thousand, that was like very against yeah. Kenny G and it, and it went viral and it like is still viral like you know to this day like if you go on Twitter someone is sharing it right now like it's it's yeah. very yeah. Yeah. it's had a lot of staying power this message board <laughs> post from like 20 years ago and I think it's because the, you know the sort of his feeling that he has in it is very well expressed and, and I think a lot of people felt that way and a lot of people um, were increasingly annoyed by this person and felt that this Louis Armstrong duet went too mm. far. And so right. I think he put voice right. to a lot of people's frustrations. Um, anyway, so we did approach him and he very politely declined and that was fine. I, I thought it would be interesting to ask him questions about it only because I, I kind of wonder, like, I mean, I, I, I assume he's surprised that this blog post, like this message, like think about the internet in the year 2000, like when I was... <laughs> I don't think you would think like this is something yeah. that's going to last for all eternity. Right. Like I have right. no idea how he thinks about that now, uh, um, but it feels like a quite lasting legacy that he <laughs> has left on this earth. And I, I was curious about that with him. But yeah, yeah. I love. I actually love Pat Metheny's music a lot. My producer does as well. We are we're, we are Pat Metheny fans. Yeah. That's the weirdness of this whole project, you know. <laughs> that Pat Metheny wouldn't be in a movie that a Pat Metheny fan likes, you know. It's all very confusing. Yeah, it is. It, it is all very confusing, and I have to put my hands up. I certainly was not. Uh, not well, I may have even been a Kenny G hater in my past, so I'll have to. I, I do have to be come clear with that. But I do think. Uh, uh, for all the reasons that we won't go into because we're running out of time and but your film so wonderfully explores I think for uh, how we all get wrapped up in a sort of zeitgeist and cultural whatever it is that we get wrapped up in certainly as we're growing up and uh, establishing our, our musical tastes um, I mean Kenny but uh, Penny uh, sorry <laughs> the Penny uh, continuing uh, is this is this film a continuation of a trend for you? You've got is there a trend here? Some I guess probably Kenny's critics would say uh, Nixon to Dr. John Romulus, Satanic Church, Kenny G. 
or what's mm-hmm. what's next for you? Well, right now I'm making a film about altruistic kidney donation, um, which is wow. also known as Good Samaritan donation. I'm a Good Samaritan donor. I donated my kidney to a stranger in 2019. Wow. And I've been working on this film about it ever since. It's very, it's personal and, you know, kind That's of amazing. ethical and whatever. It's cool. It's a cool movie. I don't really know how it's going to turn out. I'm pretty early in the process. Yeah. You know, and some other stuff I can't talk about. But yeah, lots of, I mean, I'm just always looking for like surprising, I think angles on things that are important to people um, and trying to find, yeah, surprising ways to address those things, I, I think. You know, no one, I, I'd like to believe that no one else would have had this idea for this Kenny G film and, you know, and that somehow, like, that's my yeah. thing yeah. that I'm good at, is that somehow I'm good at making films that only I could would make. Um, so, yeah. Well, let me second that and thank you so much for making it because it's, uh, we have a lot of great docs on here, but it's one of the most enjoyable ones I've seen uh recently that's for sure so i I do appreciate that and i want to thank you so much for uh uh for coming onto the podcast and just to say thank you again penny lane director listening to kenny g uh do watch it uh if you're in north america it's out on hbo and hbo max from december 2nd and the rest of us will just have to wait but i'm sure it will be out very soon so penny thank you again thank you this was fun I'd like to give a shout out to Sam and Joe at Intersound Audio in Eskrick, England. A big thanks to Nevin Apanovich, our podcast manager at Alamo Pictures, who ensures we continue getting such great guests like Penny onto the show. And finally, a big thanks to our listeners. As always, we love to hear from you, so please keep sending us feedback and episode ideas, whether it is on YouTube, social media, or directly by email. And please remember to like us and share us with your friends and family, wherever you happen to listen or watch podcasts. This is Factual America, signing off. You've been listening to Factual America. This podcast is produced by Alamo Pictures, specializing in documentaries, television, and shorts about the USA for international audiences. Head on down to the show notes for more information about today's episode, our guests, and the team behind the podcast. Subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Alamo Pictures. Be the first to hear about new productions, festivals showing our films, and to connect with our team. Our homepage is alamopictures.co.uk.